Hello. Hello. <laughs> All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Sorry, we're running a little late. Uh, that's the way it goes with these technical things. So. Yes, that's the way it goes. <laughs> but we're glad you're here. Um, just so that you know, this video will be uh, posted later. So for your friends and family that might want to see it and aren't able to, or if you have to leave for some reason, you will be able to watch it later. But we're hoping you'll stick with us because we will be able to answer some of your questions during this interview. So I'm Jennifer Benhuff. Um, I am an admin on the Ezra's Eagle page, which was founded by Mike Crowley. He lives out in California. Um, he's a fan of Michael Rowe's books. Uh, started reading them a while ago, and I think he started with the first book, and now there are four. I don't know if you can see. Yes, you can. There are four books written by author Michael Rush um, so far, <clears throat> with more to come. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, we'll, 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 <laughs> yeah, I've got lots of ideas. I'm seven chapters into one book. But I just don't have as much time as I'd like. You know, life is busy. Yeah. yeah, so Michael's got a family and a job. He is the CFO of a private equity firm. And so there's a lot going on. Um, his first book is A Remnant Shall Return. It's that red one there. Um, it's a study of the restoration of the House of Israel. It talks a lot about the return of the lost 10 tribes. And he also discusses the Ezra's Eagle prophecy in that book, mm -hmm. which is from the Apocrypha. And that is where our page, Ezra's Eagle, gets its name mm -hmm. uh, from that prophecy. Yes. Do you see a light? It's on red. Okay, someone said they couldn't hear you. Oh, oh sorry. Someone? I'll talk a little louder and a little slower. Okay. okay. Uh, make sure the mute isn't on. Is it blinking red or is it solid red? It's blinking now. Blinking, I think, means mute. Oh. Can you, Can you hear it, us now? I wonder which it's microphone good now. it's in. Mike says, Mike says okay. it's good now. Okay, okay. Sorry, it's good now. Okay. <laughs> That's great. All right, I don't know how that got pressed. <laughs> so the first book is A Remnant Shall Return, which is that restoration of the House of Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the one that got us all, all of us that are on this page, uh, really excited about the things that you were showing us from the scriptures. Um, the second book is called Daniel 11. That's a really great book to start with, I think, um, to, to, when you're first sinking your teeth into these scriptures and these revelations. Um, it was one of my favorites, and I've read it several times over and over again. A good one to take notes on. Um, the third book is called The Revelation, The Vision of John the Divine, Revelation. Um, this is the book that we discussed back in December in our previous interview. And so if you want to go back and see that, that interview was done in um, December 5th of uh, 2020. Okay, uh -huh. and now he has this new book, and I'm going to hold up this copy here. This is called Delight and Plainness, um, Nephi and Isaiah. And in this book, you describe a lot about the Isaiah chapters in Nephi, and we're going to go over some questions about that tonight. Um, but I wanted to let you know that you can get order all of these books from Michael Rush's website, which is called thelost10tribes.com, and that number 10 is the digits, not spelled out. Mm -hmm. So you can find them there, and you can also find them on Amazon. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. So, Michael, was there anything else you wanted to say to introduce yourself? Um, well, um, interestingly enough, this coming week, uh, earlier this week, I did a uh, an interview on a national radio station, um, and it was all about Ezra's Eagle. And that uh, radio station is going to have me back this coming week because they want to interview me all about, you know, the restoration of the House of Israel. So Great. that uh, radio program is Reba Live. Um, so what's it called? Reba Live. Okay. Um, the the station is Red State uh, Red State Radio. Um, but, uh, yeah, her, her program is definitely more of a, a Christian, um, program. Um, so the, the audience is, is largely, uh, Christian. So it was, uh, I had a great time on that program and I'll be doing it again next week, talking all about, you know, Remnant Shall Return. So that will be really fun for me. <clears throat> oh, we're excited for that. Okay. Yeah. When you say next week, when can we expect to see it? Um, well, we had scheduled it for Wednesday, but um, I'm going to be flying, traveling on Wednesday. So 
uh, I'm going to have to get with Reba and see if we can reschedule that for another day uh, next week. But uh, yeah, I'll I'll let you know and you can okay. post it if you if you'd Great. like. I'll do that. Okay, remind me, guys. It's, <laughs> I'm excited to listen to that too. So let's dive into some questions. Okay. Um, so we went over the books. In your first book, A Remnant Shall Return, we cover the Isaiah chapters. Mm -hmm. um, why did you feel that you needed to write another book about these same chapters? Yeah, uh, you know, originally, with, with every book that I have written subsequently to A Remnant Shall Return, I have always asked the question, does this even need to be written? Because I feel that I covered all of these things you know, really well in A Remnant Shall Return. Um, but, you know, the more that I, uh, I thought about it and, you know, in A Remnant Shall Return, I take verses from all of the different Isaiah chapters that are in the Book of Mormon. And, you know, I, I organize them according to themes and I do chapters based off of the themes of those different things. And, you know, that's great. It gives you a good feel for what those chapters are about. But, you know, people were still asking me questions all the time, saying, man, are you ever going to do an Isaiah uh, book? And I kept wondering, why do you think you need an Isaiah book? Don't you, don't you understand what, you know, the message is? And, you know, the more people I talked to, the more I realized that, you know, a book like this would be, you know, helpful. And so what I, what this book does is rather than going by theme, it goes, it takes the chapters, there's 19 Isaiah chapters, and I talk about them on a revelation by revelation basis. And so that means in, you know, when Isaiah was giving these revelations, they weren't done by chapters and verses, right? He, they were done by his whole revelation. Everything he received from the Lord, he wrote it down. And that's how they were in the brass plates. And that's how they were for the Jews until, you know, the 1400s when, you know, um, a Jewish man broke it up into chapters and verses. And that's what we have today. And chapters and verses are helpful. But can you imagine if we broke conference talks up into chapters and verses? So, okay, kids, let's read 10 verses of, you know, Elder Bednard's right. talk tonight. And then tomorrow you read another 10 verses. I mean, you're not going to, it's going to be, it's not going to flow. You're not going to remember it. You're going to go, what? what? What is this about? And that's how Isaiah sounds to us because we read chapter by chapter. So I wanted to discuss Isaiah's revelations, revelation by revelation, which means I'm often talking about five Isaiah chapters in a single chapter. So there's some pretty epic chapters in here as epic meaning they're long. Um, but by writing it that way, you get to see the entire context of what Isaiah wrote. And it's very easy to uh, determine these revelations in the book of Isaiah because each revelation starts, starts with a little scribal note and it's different from all the text around it. So um, that's, that's why I did this. And I think that uh, it will really open it up the meanings of Isaiah's words for people yeah. by studying it in this context. Well, yeah, so I, there's a follow-up question that I was going to ask you later on, but um, I think we're on that subject now. Most people don't understand uh, Isaiah, and much less the 19 chapters in the Book of Mormon. So how would you describe the theme of those chapters to someone? <clears throat> yeah, so the theme of yeah, you know, this is that's a, this is a great question because lots of people say, "Why are they in there?" Um, yeah, you know, they're they don't seem to be particularly rich in you know gospel you know teachings you know as we typical you know like the Sermon on the Mount that kind of thing, but it's in there because Nephi saw this incredible vision, you know, of the tree of life. And he saw what was going to transpire in America uh, to his seed. He saw that his seed was going to dwindle in unbelief. He saw that Jesus Christ, the God of Israel, would come and minister to his seed. 
Um, and then he saw that ultimately the Lamanites and the Nephites would fight in a horrific war and his seed would be destroyed. And then he sees what happens to the Gentiles. He sees that this land, a, a new nation would be built up and it would become the most powerful nation uh, on the earth. And that the people who helped to found it would bring with them a Bible. And that it would hold many of the covenants that the Lord has made with the house of Israel. And interestingly enough, uh, Nephi said, but it didn't contain as many revelations as the brass plates contained. But Nephi sees these incredible things. And as soon as he starts really getting into it in the last days, when he sees, yeah, there's, there's going to be this whore of Babylon. He calls it the great and vulnerable church. He calls it the whore upon many waters, the whore of all the earth. He calls it by different names, but it's the same thing. He's talking about the rise of this whore of Babylon that is, you know, this conspiring organization that is really what Ezra Ziegel is all about. Yeah. Um, that seeks to govern and control and usurp freedom and, you know, dominate the globe. And as he sees that they will wage a war against the church of the Lamb of God. And then he sees that when that happens, the saints and the covenant people of the Lord, which is interesting because he says, he, he, he's referring to them as two different people. Then he, he says that a war will be waged against them and they will be endowed with great power from on high. And then he says, you know, the angel told me I'm about to see a lot more, but you don't write any of this. John the Revelator is going to write about this, and others are going to write about this. But Nephi is not going to write about this in his plain and simple language. And so the very next chapter, Nephi starts talking about Isaiah. And then he transcribes these 19 chapters. And what most people fail to realize about First and Second Nephi is they're not two separate books. It's one book. It's one project. And the Lord told Nephi what to write in it. Most people think that this is kind of like Nephi's journal, but yeah. it's not. He did not write it when he was young. He wrote it when he was old. Um, and, you know, when you understand that, then the context of how, I, how Nephi talks about these Isaiah dreams, it's always linking back to his dream that he had. And... You know, it's, you begin to realize Nephi is explaining to us in Isaiah's words what he saw, but was not permitted to tell us in his plain English or, you know, <laughs> right. reformed right. Egyptian or yeah, whatever he was writing in. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, so it's, it becomes very interesting. That is what those Isaiah chapters are about. All 19 of them are all about what Nephi saw in this vision would happen to the Gentiles in the latter days. And it all revolves around the Lord and his promises and covenants that he has made to the house of Israel. And the restoration of the house of Israel plays a major component of these events. So when you look at those chapters, it, they're all about the last days. They're all about what's going to happen to the Gentiles. And they're all about the restoration and the events pertaining to the restoration of the house of Israel. And what do you think is the biggest part of that? The most important part of that? <clears throat> uh, the most important part? Of, well, people do not understand the restoration of the house of Israel really at all. People don't understand why Israel is even relevant. When people think of Israel today, they think of the Jews. The Jews are one of 12 tribes of Israel. And the Lord promised that Israel would be restored in its totality. It would be as if they had never left. So there is something that is going to happen that is not on our radar. And... 
you know, we tend to think of, hey, we're working on gathering Israel on both sides of the veil, um, and we are. You know, when we go and do missionary work, um, we are trying to find people that are receptive to this message. And the people that are receptive to this message, I am convinced, are receptive because it is part of them. You know, that they are being prepared by the Lord because they are part of the house of Israel. And sorry, my mouth gets really dry when I talk. Yeah, no, it's okay. So long. But, you know, this is what the restoration is about, is two components. In um, the 10th article of faith, it says, we believe in the literal gathering of mm -hmm. Israel and in the restoration of the lost 10 tribes. Now, an event of restoration is totally different than an event of gathering. You and I, your daughter and my daughter are on missions. They are working together. You know, they're very young and it's miraculous that they're doing this, right? Um, but the scriptures talk about the restoration of the house of Israel rivaling the exodus of Egypt for its wonder and might. What our daughters are doing is miraculous to us. Yeah. Um, but nobody is going to say, yeah, what uh, Haley and Mallory are doing rivals the exodus of Egypt. Um, but these events will. And when you start reading the Isaiah chapters in the Book of Mormon, you begin to understand why they are going to rival the exodus of Egypt. And it is shocking. It will, these events will blow your socks off. If you don't, and they are not on the radar of the vast majority of human beings on this earth. And that is why there are so many scriptures about the last days, about people being unprepared. You know, the, the 10 virgins, that's a parable to the church, and half of them were unprepared. Yeah. And then you have these parables of, hey, if the good man of the house knew that he was about to, you know, be robbed, he would prepare in advance, but he didn't know. Um, and so much of mankind is not prepared because they have no idea about these covenants that the Lord has made. They think that they are obsolete, but they are not obsolete. Um, the, one of my favorite passages in Isaiah talks about the Jews and the state of the Jews, because the Jews are going to have a really difficult time. Um, I mean, we all have heard about the Battle of Armageddon, Gog, Magog. Um, we may not associate that battle with the Latter-day Antichrist, but it is. That's what mm -hmm. this is about. And the Jews are going to be sieged for three and a half years, and it's going to be horrific for them. And Isaiah is talking about this, and he um, it's a metaphor wherein in the metaphor, Israel or the Jews specifically are a widowed woman. And this widowed woman is falling on the ground and she's weeping and she's got sackcloth and ashes on and she's wailing for the loss of her children. And then she sees this massive host come and populate all the lands of Israel's inheritance. And she's shocked. And she goes, these, she recognizes these as being her children. She goes, these, where have they been? Isaiah says something, he says, can a nation be born in a single day? Yet these will be in a single day. The lands will be overflown to the point that these will say, Make place for us. This the land is too straight. We don't we don't have you know enough space here. They're going to overflow all the lands of their inheritance. And this and you know the Jews are sitting there going, how where have these been? Yeah. And you know so that is that starts to shed light on what these coming events are going to be like. They will be incredible when Christ. And Isaiah, Isaiah, actually Christ quotes Isaiah and says, when these things happen, kings will shut their mouths for that which they had not considered shall they see. And in here, the king 
is a, also a metaphor for the most learned men on the planet because kings have access to large infrastructures of information, right? And so they should know everything, but they're going to be shocked by these events as, at, you know, because they weren't even on their radar. So <clears throat> that is what the Isaiah chapters in the Book of Mormon are about. And it, it's a shame because everyone skips over them. Yes. Um, and so they don't, they don't see it. Um, and that's what I hope that this book does, uh, is highlights what these things mean so that rather than skipping over those things, because Christ commanded us to study them. Yes. Um, those chapters are my favorite in the Book of Mormon. And I hope that this will open people's eyes to the wonder of those chapters and make you grateful for what Nephi did and what Isaiah did and what the Lord did by specifically, well, he commanded us, hey, study the words of Isaiah. And then here's the cliff notes, these 19 chapters, study those. And still most of us, ooh, Isaiah, can't, can't be bothered with that. Yeah. You know, so. Well, um, <clears throat> I'm glad you talked about this because President Nelson refers to the restoration as the ongoing restoration, not Absolutely. like it was a singular event back in 1830. Correct. Um, it's the ongoing restoration. So what you just described is an ongoing restoration. Is Do you think that there will be a restoration of more scriptures as well? Abs Absolutely. Yeah. I mean... That's that's one of the things that's in uh, in the Isaiah chapters is talking about new scriptures that comes uh, in the latter days. I mean, Nephi, when he's talking about the Isaiah chapters and kind of giving his commentary on them, he says, you know, the Jews, the day will come when the Jews will have the record of my people and my people will have the record of the Jews and both of them will have the records of the lost tribes of Israel. And the lost tribes of Israel will have the records of the Jews and of Joseph. So, yes, we will have more scriptures than we can fathom. But we need to take advantage of what we have now. Um, there's very interesting uh, revelations that have been given within um, modern revelations that talk about John and his Latter-day mission. And one of the things, um, one of the specific missions, I mean, in the book of Revelation, John is given this scroll. And he's told, eat this. Mm -hmm. And Joseph Smith asked the Lord, hey, what, what was that all about? What did that mean? And the Lord told him that it was a mission for John and that John was Elias and that he would come and restore Israel and restore all things. So John has a role to play, and the restoration of the house of Israel is part of that. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, well, you're talking about revelation. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about a lot about receiving revelation in your book. <clears throat> yeah. So we're hearing a lot of, about receiving our own revelation from the prophets. In fact, more than ever before, it seems to be the overriding theme of our recent conference talks. Mm -hmm. Learn to receive your own revelation. And since you talk so much about it in your book, what tips would you give to our audience and to your readers about receiving revelation? Well, you know, I, th I think that, you know, when President Nelson says it will not be possible to survive the coming days without the constant guiding influence of the Holy Ghost, that means we have to have the Holy Ghost with us. And the Holy Ghost, if you have the Holy Ghost with you, it is communicating with you. That's how you know you. You know, some people uh, feel it in their heart as a calming sensation. People feel it in different ways. But it's always communicating something to you. And that's why it's important for when you feel the Holy Ghost to stop and say, hold on, why? What is it telling me? What do I need to do about this? Um, so you need to learn what the whole, how the Holy Ghost communicates to you in your own life. But more than that, Nephi, and this is one of the coolest sub themes in Nephi's writings is that, Hey, 
the Lord wants to teach you. And if you will go to him, he will teach you. You know, when Lehi comes to his family and says, hey, the Lord told me we all need to leave. No one was happy. Even Nephi wasn't happy. And so he went and prayed to the Lord and said, is this real? Um, and he said that the Lord softened his heart and he didn't rebel like his brothers. And then the Lord spoke to him. Not only did he know, yeah, this is right, but this is why. And he shows Nephi the promised land and what is going to happen there. And Nephi learns from that. Every time uh, Lehi has an a incredible revelation, Nephi goes to the Lord about it. He's not content with just hearing. He believed it. Yeah. But he also knew, I want I want that from the Lord. I want to go to the source. Mm -hmm. And so many of us are completely content with receiving their spiritual education secondhand. Yeah. But Nephi was not. And he continually pushed that message in the Book of Mormon, saying, the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if you will seek, you will find. And at the end of his book, he mourns because he says, you know, I have written this as plain as the word can be. And if you don't understand it, it will be because you do not ask and you do not knock. Therefore, you will perish in the dark. But it doesn't need to be that way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so when you see that pattern, you need to ask yourself, is ne was it different for Nephi than it is for you? You know, Laman and Lemuel did not believe that the Lord could speak to them. The Lord maketh no such things known unto us. But Nephi did, and Nephi had incredible you know, revelations. Now, this doesn't mean that all of us are going to have you know, angels come and speak to us, but the Lord will work with us according to the spiritual gifts that we have. You have spiritual gifts that are different from my spiritual gifts. And so you're going to receive light and knowledge from the Lord in different ways and avenues than I will. And the reason that the Lord gives different people give different spiritual gifts is because we can help each other because of the gifts that we've been given. But we need to start searching. We need to be actively engaged and we need to take responsibility for our own spiritual education. I like what you said, how you compared all of us could be like Nephi if we want to be. Maybe we're not prophets, but we're entitled to revelation, like you said. In fact, it was, I believe it was Spencer W. Kimball, President Kimball or President Hinckley said, if you go to church and you say it was boring or you didn't get anything out of it, that's your fault because there's always going to be something awkward. So on that note, um, a lot of people believe that we don't need to understand what might be referred to as the mysteries of God. That's how you refer to it uh -huh. in your book, the mysteries of God. But Nephi does talk about these mysteries quite often. Um, so how would you define mysteries of God? And why? And the reason I ask this is because there's a lot of talk about, uh, as we study books like yours um, and we do our own study, some people feel more comfortable just sticking to the basics. And when you when we listen to the conference talks, we do go over the basics. But then there's all this other hidden treasures that we can dig for if we want to. But there is a sort of push-pull among members of the church and others, like, do we really need to do that? Why? Yeah. Why I mean, that, that is a fantastic question, Jennifer, and it's, it's in, very important that we understand this. Because I can't tell you how many people have brought this same thing up uh, to me. So in the church, I mean, Nephi talks about the mysteries of God. Verse, you know, first Nephi chapter one, verse one. Mm -hmm. um, to him, the mysteries of God were vital to us. And we, and, and there's good reason for this, uh, have the mysteries of God have a negative connotation to us. When when we think of the mysteries of God, we think of, you know, 
where's cool up? <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. things like that. But the fact of the matter is, Jesus Christ is the greatest mystery of the Old Testament. So let's just look at the Jews, okay? The Jews, if they were focused on the basics, they were, you know, trying to keep the Sabbath day holy, keep all of the laws, um, do everything that the people in the synagogue told them. Um, and when Christ came, Law Moses. they did not accept him. He came to his own and his own received him not. Why? Because they did not understand the mystery of the Old Testament. It was there. They needed to understand it, but they did not. And so they rejected the very God they claimed to worship. And so Christ, you know, he's talking to Peter and he says, Peter, who's saying, who say man that I am? Mm -hmm. Well, some say that you're, you know, John the Baptist come back. Some say that you're Elias. Some say this, that, and the other. And Christ says, Peter, who do you say that I am? Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Blessed art thou, Peter, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but my Father who is in heaven. Peter received a mystery from God. He did not, nor could he have, received that in his synagogue because those people rejected Christ. So the Lord made it this way. He could have made him himself much more evident mm -hmm. in the scriptures, just like he could provide much more evidence <laughs> than he has for the veracity of the Book of Mormon, all, all of these things. But that is not his objective. His objective is to get us to seek for him and for him to draw near unto me and I will draw near unto you. That is what the mysteries of God are, is being taught by the Lord, not by men. And the Lord will reveal to you his mysteries. Um, so we're not talking about wacky deep doctrines. Mm -hmm. We're talking about information that is vital for us to understand, but that the only way that we will understand it is if we seek for it and the Lord ratifies it to us. There's a, an incredible example of this in the Old Testament. And this is in um it's in the book of exodus it's literally three days after the house of israel has come through the ocean well, the red sea on uh dry ground and the lord says i want to talk to my people so you moses you gather everyone around the base of mount horeb and i will talk to them directly and they will hear this from me and so the people gather around the base of mount horeb and then, you know, it's the time for the Lord to come draw us nigh. The ground begins to shake and tremble and smoke begins to come out of the seams of the rocks. And they begin to hear trumpets blasting from the heavens. And this dark cloud comes down and rests on the top of the mountain. And, you know, lightning bolts are sounding. And, you know, it's as if the mountain is going to explode. And so the people are terrified. And they start going the other direction. And Moses says, whoa, whoa, don't fear the Lord. And they say, Moses, we can't talk to the Lord. If we even hear his voice, it will kill us. And Moses says, come on. <laughs> but they go to the opposite side of the valley. And Moses goes towards the, lo the Lord. So you see what happens there. And Israel said, listen. Our spiritual education is in your hands, Moses. You tell us everything we need to know. We're going to go be over there. Come tell us it when you have time. You know, and the same things are happening today. Yeah. If I need to know this, they're going to tell me in general conference. And meanwhile, we have talks in general conference where Elder Bednar is saying, listen, 
If all you know about the gospel is what I tell you or other people tell you, your testimony is built upon sand. So it's not our responsibility to teach you everything you should know, to everything that you should do. You need to learn what you should do and you need to learn what you should know. In other words, you, the, the onus of your spiritual education is on your shoulders. Otherwise, the same thing that happened to the Jews will happen again today and has all throughout Christianity. I mean, you have people going to their pastors to find out what the truth is rather than to the Lord. Yeah. Um, so it's just painted a slightly different shade in our church, but it's the same color. We need to go and seek the Lord and we need to, to knock and he will answer. But if we don't, we are going to need to try to make sense of all of these events as they're happening. Yeah. And that is why Christ said, listen, in the last days, there's an antichrist. He's going to come and he's going to deceive the very elect. If it were possible, the very elect, even, you know, according to the covenant, meaning Hey, the, the most elite among you, the most knowledgeable among you, could be deceived by this guy. So we need to go to the Lord. Okay, so you're saying that we're at the same risk today, um, as you mentioned in your book that Nephi and Isaiah talk about Israel. They have eyes to see, but they don't see. They have ears to hear, they're not hearing. They have hearts, but they're not feeling. And we do project that back on the Jews. That's how they were. Yeah. But uh, many people are like this, complacent. Many people mm -hmm. want to just be spoon fed. And I think that that's throughout all religions. People want to go and sit and listen and be spoon fed. But you're saying that, yeah. and you know, you brought up a good point. They do tell us, read your script. You know, we've been hearing that since we were, whenever we came into the church, read your scriptures. And they say it over and over, so we'll remember because we forget, right? Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit, you touched on it. There will be deceivers, deception. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you think that that's already happening now? Like, how so? Oh, absolutely. And Isaiah talks about this. I mean, he, he sees, you know, our day. It's very clear that he does. And Nephi sees, he saw our day. He was shown all of these things. He just couldn't write about them. Um, and, you know, one of the things that Nephi says is, listen, guys, do not say that all is well in Zion because it isn't. I see your day and I know that it's not all well there. Um, and, you know, Isaiah says the day is going to come when the wicked will take the righteousness from the righteous. In other words, if you are trying to stand up for traditional Judeo-Christian values, you will be the bad guy. You are the one that's unenlightened. Um, you are the bigot. Mm -hmm. And this new all-encompassing philosophy of anything goes is, you know, the enlightened choice. Mm -hmm. So Isaiah said, you know, you know, wrong will be right, up will be down. And yeah, that has happened. So that is the spirit of deception. And this is the evidence that the whore of Babylon has infiltrated the world and is flipping the traditional narrative on us. And many people can't see that it's happening. They don't have eyes to see it. They, you know, just continue on. Um, that's just one example of this, but I mean, it, it can be elaborated on in many different ways. So what would be your advice then? And I'm not speaking as a prophet, of course, but um, it does feel like what's right, what's wrong is right, what's right is wrong. Because a lot of these values, you know, things about equality and unity and all of this, it sounds good. Right? So what do the scriptures tell us? How do we stand up without alienating our neighbors and without looking unenlightened or without looking like 
we are bigots? You know, like how how do you well stand yeah, up? you know Christ? I mean, Christ said the entire gospel can be summarized in two things: love God and love your neighbor. And Satan is taking that concept and twisting it. And Satan is at his very best when he does things like that, takes truth and morphs it into, um, yeah, you should, it's all about love, right? So as long as it's about love, the commandments can go out the window, you know? But what we need to do, and the most important thing that we need to do is be filled with that love. Um, Moroni saw our last day. I mean, he said, listen, Gentiles, I know you. I've seen you. Jesus Christ has made, has shown me you. I know your day. I know what's going to happen. And, you know, he said, there's no hope for you unless you have charity. And that's what we need. The world needs more charity. We don't need more confrontations in chat rooms or, you know, visceral encounters. There's enough of that. Yeah. Um, Jesus Christ said, listen, contention is not of me, but is of the devil, who stirreth up the hearts of the children of men to contend with anger, one with another. This isn't my doctrine. My doctrine is that such things should be done away with. <clears throat> and that's what we need to do. And Rowan and I said, Listen, if you can be filled with charity, it will be well with you when he comes again, because you will be like him. And that's what we can do. So even though we don't agree necessarily with the prevailing popular, uh, uh, what is it, social norms, things like that, anything goes, if we're charitable toward our neighbor and not judgy maybe <laughs> then yeah, i mean how many times did christ tell us to not judge yeah. each other um you know but we that doesn't mean that we cannot discern between right and wrong we can know that hey this is not acceptable behavior but that doesn't mean that you need to be mean mm -hmm. um and you know, the, the best way to change people is not, I mean, I love this part of the Book of Mormon where, you know, this is an Alamo where it talks about, hey, the thing that had the most profound impact on the people, more profound than the sword and wars and desolations, was the gospel, the doctrine, pure and simple. By teaching the doctrine, and by the doctrine having a, re a resonant harmonic with our own life because we are living it and people can see, hey, there's something different in your countenance. Yeah. Um, that is how you can help people. And the fact of the matter is you cannot help people until they want to be helped. Um, otherwise, you are just going to be fighting and arguing and... Right. You will not win. It's not productive. Um, this is just a little off, but I just wanted to share this because you said something. <clears throat> Your daughter um, shared a missionary letter recently, and, and she was talking about there was somebody who really wanted to be taught, right? Uh, but the schedules weren't matching up because missionaries are so busy, and this person was busy, and it wasn't. And then he sent that message to them <laughs> that said, how do I change my life if you don't have time for me, <laughs> yeah. right? So I love that example of somebody who really wants to be taught. Yeah. Um, and, and I like that about how, you know, we don't argue, we don't point fingers, uh, we stand up for what's right, but then we jump in and help and are charitable and kind. No yeah, matter you, what. you can't teach a cold and prickly, you know, person. Um, yeah. But... You can pray for that person and the Lord can soften them. And then the Holy Ghost can tell you, that person may be ready for you to say this. Mm. Um, and that's, that's how the Lord works, by long suffering. 
you know, by persuasion, uh, by brotherly love, um, not by... Yeah. Which is a tough lesson to learn in, <laughs> in life. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you quote a lot of scriptures in your books um, where we are admonished by the Lord to meet together. In fact, our... Um, theme at girls camp and i think this might be throughout the church this year is gather right mm -hmm. oh i'm sorry it's not girls camp it's an it's another humanitarian one. anyway gather seems to be a prevailing theme this year for a lot of our auxiliaries and and organization so in the scriptures we're admonished by the lord to meet together and you say it's to discuss theory principles laws and doctrine we've talked a lot about doctrine tonight um but of these four things theory stands out. Can you explain why theory is important? What do you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, there's there's several scriptures in the Doctrine and Covenants that say mm -hmm. that we should discuss, you know, theory, laws, doctrines. Mike, can you repeat the question? They're not getting the question. So, oh, they're not. Oh. It's I'm not, sorry. The mic is not, it seems like I get most audio when you, and you're more soft-spoken and Mike's very loud. So, <laughs> I don't know, can, she says pick the mic up. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Can you, Hello, can you guys hear me now? Okay, take the mic to your mouth. All right, can you hear me now, Andrew? <laughs> okay, is, is that not working? Is do we need to bring the? Is it the? Yeah, I don't know that that microphone is connecting to that. Oh, okay. I will speak louder. If okay. I bring you closer, then yeah. I won't have you in the frame. Okay. Oh. All right. We'll just project loudly. Just, okay. Maybe towards that. I'm louder. <laughs> Um, you quote a lot of scriptures where we're admonished uh, by the Lord to meet together. And in the Doctrine and Covenants, like you said, we're asked to discuss theory, principles, laws, and doctrine. We've talked a lot about doctrine tonight already, but of the four, theory stands out. Can you explain what theory is and why it's important? Yeah. So... Um... This is, you know, I think it's very important that we understand this because most of our time is spent on discussing principles, um, doctrines, um, laws. Uh, the, that's the kind of thing that, you know, we find in the scriptures. But theory is how, what does the gospel mean to me? What does the gospel mean to you? Um, and different people have different theories for the gospel. For instance, Laman and Lemuel, their theory was, hey, dad can talk to the Lord, but I can't. Yeah. And many people have theories, the prophet can talk to the Lord, and the prophet will tell me everything I need to know. Mm -hmm. And if it's important, he'll tell me. That is the, the way they see the, earth, the world, the, the gospel. But, you know, it doesn't mean what, I mean, a theory can, is not necessarily true. Um, so we need to discuss, hey, what is the gospel paradigm that you see this principle through? How can you implement this in your life? Because the gospel doesn't really mean anything if, you don't think it applies to you. Like the whole concept of be believing Christ, believing that what he teaches actually applies to you. And, you know, that you can have these things happen. Most people can readily believe how, oh yeah, I can, I can believe that, uh, you know, if so-and-so goes to the Lord and prays, they're going to get help with this. But then you have this own problem in your life that you, you're thinking, oh, geez, I don't know. You yeah. know. And so, I mean, clearly there is a disconnect there with your personal, you know, way that you see the world. And, you know, I, I think that there's a marvelous example of this in the Book of Mormon. And I think that it's, and I talk about this in my book, it's uh, the difference between Mahan Rai Moriakamur mm -hmm. and Nephi. And both of them are described as being 
large in stature, and highly favored of the Lord. Uh, I, I find that interesting. But highly favored of the Lord means that, you know, you can understand the Lord. You can hear his word. It's not, communication is, is easier for you with the Lord. It's a spiritual gift that you have. Mm -hmm. And so Mahanrai Moriankumar had that. And his brother recognized that Mahanrai had that gift. And so after the Lord confounded people's languages, you know, the brother of, you know, Jared, Mahanrai Moriankumar's brother, says, go ask the Lord if he won't confound our languages and the languages of our friends. And so he goes and asks the Lord and the Lord answers his prayer. And then his brother says, hey, go and ask the Lord if maybe there's a land of promise that, you know, he would give us. And so Mahan Raymarankumar goes and um, asks the Lord. And each time that Mahan Raymarankumar goes, he, his prayers are, are answered. And they're led through the wilderness and they arrive to you know, the, the great sea. But they've crossed many smaller seas. It says that they had to create barges before. And so they finally get to this beach and the scriptures say that they just relaxed for four years. And then uh, the Lord comes to Mahan Raymoriankamer and it says specifically for three hours, the Lord, you know, ripped into Mahan Raymoriankamer <laughs> because, you know, he had forgotten the Lord. So Which here, is easy to do when you're comfortable. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's easy to do, you know, when you're on a beach. And so, you know, Mahanre Moriankamer knew that the objective was to get to the promised land across these waters. He also knew, hey, we've crossed waters before in airtight, dark caves that we make, and it's not very fun. And it's smelly, and we move all around. And he had four years to think about this problem, but he does nothing. Um, and because there's this pattern of someone else coming to Mahanre Morankamar and say, hey, do this. Okay. Um, he doesn't take this gift and start developing it him, himself until the Lord comes. And then it's all business. They go and they make these barges. They pound them all out. Eight of, eight of them. After the exact manner of the previous barges. And while they're making them, Mahan Ray goes, oh, geez, see how big that ocean is? There's no air in these things. It's totally dark. Where are we going to go to the bathroom? How are we going to get rid of it? You know, he's got all these problems that, that he knows about. If he doesn't know about them, his wife certainly knows yeah, about them. Yeah. Uh, but he's doing it anyways because he's behind schedule. Yeah. And only after he's done with them, then he goes, Lord, I did it. I made the barges, but there's no air in them yeah. and there's no light in them. And that's a really big ocean. What are we going to, what are we going to do? And it's only then that Mahanrai has the most incredible spiritual experience of his entire life. When he changes it, the the narrative from one of his brother coming and telling him what to do to him having a collaborative experience with the Lord. And then what, you know, the result of that collaborative experience is still sealed to us. Yes. You know, it's that special. Mm -hmm. Now let's contrast that experience with Nephi's experience, mm -hmm. who from the very beginning, his Lord, his father taught him, hey, if you want to know something, go to the Lord, ask him. Mm -hmm. So Nephi comes to a large ocean mm -hmm. and he doesn't know how to cross it. And his experience is a collaborative one from the get-go. Yeah. Mahanrai Moriankumar crosses that ocean in a dark, well, not dark because of the collaborative yeah. effort, but still, 
their propulsion method is being pounded by the monster waves that are driving them under, and then they bop back up, driving them under. For, you know, a year they do this. So, Mahan Rehmer's method traveling is like this. <laughs> you know, going across, they're like beans in a maraca, right? Yeah. And Nephi is crossing the ocean on a yacht. Yeah, you know, compare. Look at those two <laughs> things. The the only maracas on Nephi's ship were the ones that Laman and Lemuel used in their boisterous parties. You know, but uh, that's the difference. <clears throat> you know, so, so you it's it's about paradigms. It's about what does this what does this mean to you? Could you use your spiritual gifts to really bless the lives of other people? Can you have a relationship with the Lord? Can the Lord be active in your life or not? Do you not believe that? Do you believe that the Lord reserves all of that for the prophet? Many people have that. Yes. Many people think if I need to know something, I need to go to my pastor, my preacher, my bishop, my the general authority of my church, because mm -hmm. the Lord maketh no such things known unto me. So that is what we're talking about with gospel theory. What is your gospel theory? How do how does the gospel real how do you see these things? These principles of ask and you shall receive. What does that really mean to you? Um, and it means you know if if we're acting on those things, we act. Think of our theory as like our internal operating system. We can't do things that are outside of our internal operating system. If if you need to do a, you know some new kind of program, you need to download it. We need to do the same thing. Um, but if we don't believe that the Lord can do that for us, then we have put ourselves in our own box. So that's why it's important for us to have conversations of what does this mean? I mean, what do you think? I mean, so and, gathering, sharing. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, 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 talking about how can we... How can we apply these concepts in our lives? Yeah. How can we how can we use these things that are all over in the scriptures? How can we use them? Okay, so you've opened up something new then for me personally because I'm sitting here and, I, and um, in the most recent conference talks, but you know, really lately over the last few years, they've really focused. Oh, I know I'm not loud enough. They have really focused on faith. And we can look at that from a basic concept, like faith, okay, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. I believe that he lives. But now you're saying it takes more than that, that you actually have to put effort into building that relationship and that you need to dig for these mysteries. When they're, so when the prophets are telling us, have faith, exercise faith, it's more than just, I believe, therefore I'm saved. Right. Yeah. And I believe, therefore, I will be led through these latter days just because I believe. But if the Lord wants us and he does, because he tells us this in Nephi and you covered that, if he wants us to understand and dig for these mysteries of God, why is it so hard? <laughs> like, why are they so cryptic? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a great question and an important question to you know, talk about as well. I mean, in the Book of Mormon, you know, Nephi is told, hey, the record of the Jews, it goes through the tentacles of this whore of Babylon. And the whore of Babylon edits it okay. and removes many, you know, of the plain and precious parts of the gospel and many of the covenants of the Lord. And so now we lack a lot of the understanding. And... I am convinced that one of the reasons that, you know, so, like the book of Revelation and um, many of the words of the prophets, um, you know, the prophets are usually uh, prophets that had intimate firsthand experience with the scattering or gathering of Israel. Right. I never thought of it that way, but that's true. Yeah. Yeah. So Isaiah, for instance, the uh, northern kingdom of Israel was destroyed and taken into captivity when he was a prophet. He named both of his sons for those events through Revelation. Um, 
Let's do but, more. Let's, can you expound on that? Yeah. So, 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 you know, he writes the way that he writes, um, and the cryptic nature of what he says protects it because, you know, people aren't going to come and edit that which they don't understand. Uh, uh, Revelation is the same way. Daniel is the same way. These things came through to us. I and mean, when you look at the Joseph Smith translation of the book of Revelation and Isaiah, very little has changed or been updated. The things that have been updated are amazing, but they're usually words. Not, you know, much of the text changes because the Whore of Babylon had no clue what it meant. That encryption protected it. In the same way Christ spoke in parables. Mm -hmm. He spoke in parables and everybody could hear it. The Whore of Babylon was there listening to it. I mean, you, ha you had, you know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, members of the Sanhedrin, you know, listening to these things. But they weren't getting it. And that's, these things are encrypted, but the Holy Ghost is the encryption key. So if you think goodness that they were written this way, because had they not been, we would not have the truth. I'm convinced that we would not have the truth that is in them. It would have been altered and removed. Um, but... Uh, well, even today, I would say most people don't see everything that's in especially the bible but oh well you know, uh, well the, the scriptures are always like an onion right yeah lots of us are very familiar with the outer side of an onion but there's layers and layers and scriptures mean different things to you at different times in your life after you've you know experienced different things i mean you'll have aha moments on the same verse over and over in your life because the spirit can touch you in different ways but that, I believe, is why you have this spiritual encryption in Isaiah. But when Christ tells you to study it, especially in the context of the Book of Mormon, because you literally have Nephi as a commentator and Jacob as a commentator on what these things mean. Yes. Um, but you, you need to read them. I mean, it's very beneficial to listen to First and Second Nephi in one city. If you're on a really long trip... Do it, and you'll see it in a whole different way because it was it was presented as a single message, and you see that when you listen to it. Um, so it's like a conference talk. It is, yeah. But that is exactly what it's like. It's it's his message to us. I'm going to listen to it like a conference <clears throat> talk. That's a great yeah. idea. Yeah. Um, another thing that you talk about, uh, where do I have that? Is you talk about the light of Christ. Um, we're told in, uh, I believe, 3rd Nephi that all men are born with the light of Christ, right? Mm -hmm. But you, you talk about it as a medium of power. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you mean by that? <clears throat> so most people are confused by the Holy Ghost and the light of Christ. And in the, the scriptures, we often talk about the Spirit of God, um, you know, the Spirit of the Lord. Um, these are... The Holy Ghost is an individual. He is, he has a spirit body. He is in one place at one time, uh, just like God the Father is in one place. I mean, the Holy Ghost isn't like Voldemort who has split himself into a bunch of horcruxes so he can be, you know, everywhere at once. The light of Christ is a medium that is pervasive throughout the universe. It is everywhere. It is in, in all things, past, present, and future. And because it is everywhere and in all things, all things are before the Lord at all times. And in the Doctrine and Covenants, it says that the light of Christ is the power whereby God governs all things. So that is the medium that the Holy Ghost uses to influence us think of think of the light of christ as a spiritual wi-fi signal it's everywhere this house is filled with wi-fi mm -hmm. 
you know, we can't, I can't move anywhere and be out of it. I can't do anything bad and then no longer be surrounded by the Wi-Fi signal. Um, the same thing is true with the light of Christ. The light of Christ is in you, around you, everywhere, and there's nothing that you can do to change that. You are surrounded by it, engulfed by that all times. Are you saying it's the same thing as the companionship of the Holy Ghost that no. you receive? Okay. No, that's different. So how does it work then if the Holy Ghost is only in one place at a time? But when we receive the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost, the gift of the Holy Ghost, how does that work? Okay, so it's it's like you know, if the Wi-Fi signal is everywhere mm -hmm. and you have a smartphone that can tap into that signal, then you can receive new software that changes your phone and gives it functionality that revolutionizes what you can do with it. In the same way, you can use the light of Christ to become an entirely new person. And think of the Holy Ghost as the administrator of this spiritual network, okay? okay? If, if you want to grow and develop in this medium, it's not going to happen accidentally. You don't log on to somebody's Wi-Fi that's encrypted accidentally. You can receive push notifications on your phone without, you know, requesting them. Hey, a tornado is coming. Hey, an Amber alert. Look for this car. But you can receive so much more than that. The Holy Ghost can talk to anybody and does, um, regardless of what's going on in their lives, and can prepare people through the same through the same thing. But it can be so much more than that. And so, I mean, just like you know, using the same you know metaphor of Wi-Fi. I mean, we've all been on Wi-Fi, you know, that spotty. It's frustrating. Yes. You're trying to watch a Netflix show and it stops all the time. Mm -hmm. You're having buffering issues. You need a better connection than that. So you've got to do something to get a better connection. Better connections don't just happen. Mm -hmm. So you can upgrade, you know, you can get fiber. You can do other things that make it so that connection to you is clear. And ultimately, you can plug into the server itself, and I mean, yeah, y you have it all. So this is holy places. <clears throat> yeah, this this is you know receiving the Holy Ghost. I mean, Elder Bednar said, "Hey, when hands are placed upon your head, that is a priesthood injunction to receive the Holy Ghost. You need to do it. It doesn't just happen to you." Um. And so we need to be actively involved in that. And in 3rd Nephi, there is a beautiful example of this, of people changing because of the Holy Ghost. And my, my favorite chapter in the entire Book of Mormon is Helaman chapter 5. And in that, you have a bunch of bloodthirsty Nephi, or uh, Lamanites and Nephi yeah. dissenters, coming to kill two missionaries in prison. And the Lord changes them. And he changes them through this medium. And they're totally different afterwards. And the same thing can happen with, with us. But the Holy Ghost uses this to help us. And the more that you understand about this, you know, the more you can use it. Um, but the light of Christ is it's a force that's omnipresent, but it, it has no personality. It has no will of its own. It exists to be acted upon, to be used. And the Lord can use it. That is how he can, you know, tell water to change to wine. Everything is governed by this power. 
and the molecules instantaneously reorganize themselves. Nothing is impossible. Literally nothing is impossible. We only think it is. But, you know, through this power, all things can literally be done. And we need the Holy Ghost to help us progress and to guide us through this power. So there's the, this force, and then the Holy Ghost is the teacher and the, the governor, the administrator of this. And it's made possible for us because of Christ and his atonement. Yes. So. <clears throat> oh, wonderful. So um, that's all the prepared questions that I have, but I know that our, our viewers, um, I'm looking to see if there's any questions. I'm wondering, I know our viewers want to talk a little bit about what we need to be prepared for going forward. So, um, you know, especially in Remnant and in Daniel 11, well, all of them really, but you, you really cover um, a lot of what we're going to be seeing around us in on the yeah. world stage. Okay. How much, you know, we're told to prepare temporally and spiritually. Uh -huh. When you say prepare spiritually, what we, I think we've covered it in our discussion, but let's go over it again because there, there are so many people who are confused, like, do they need to sell their house and move to some land? You know, things like that, which sounds drastic. But really what we're being taught by the prophets is to prepare spiritually. Mm -hmm. However, we're also taught that we have to dig for our own revelations and instruction. From the Lord, yeah. What I, would you say is instruction for all of us? Yeah, I would think. I, I would say. I mean, physical preparations are very important. We've been told what to do there um, for many years, um, and I I believe that the time will come when we will desperately be relying on the physical preparations that we should have all made. That being said, the most important thing that we can do is spiritual in nature. We need to connect, you know, going back to this Wi-Fi signal, we need to connect to the server. We need to be able to understand from the Lord what he wants us to do. Um, we need to be spiritually independent, not dependent upon so many people say, if it's important and I need to know it, they're going to tell me, meaning other men, yeah. other human beings. But what happens if something disrupts communication or terrestrial communications, you know, and we can't pick up a, um, a cell phone and call somebody? Mm -hmm. You know, Daniel said... If we don't have internet. <clears throat> Yeah, if you don't have internet, if you don't have, you know, cell phone coverage, you know, what do you do? Why is the church pushing towards home-centered, church-supported religion? Um, because we need to be able to stand on our own two legs. We need to be able to receive revelation for ourselves and our families. Um, that is coming, and it's coming soon. And... It's going to be intense and we will need the Lord to be able to provide for us. And we will need to know where should I be? What should I be doing? Uh, if you don't know that now, you those are the preparations you need to be working on. They're going to be far more important than, you know, how much money do you have squirreled away in your bank account? You know, how valuable is that food storage that you have in your you know, basement if a mudslide comes and takes out your home, you know, or, you know, an earthquake or a tsunami or things like that. But the spiritual preparation and the promptings and the guidance is going to be invaluable. You will not be able to survive the coming day without it you will be able to survive the coming day um, if you don't have food storage because ours is a God that can produce manna. Yeah. 
yeah. can cause water to come from rocks, can do incredible things. But we need to get in line with him. He is our most important spiritual preparation. So, yeah. You were going to quote Daniel. <clears throat> well, Daniel said, I mean, if you look at, I mean, and it's not just Daniel, but other people say this too, that the coming times of trial will be more intense than any time since there's been a nation. Since the beginning of creation, these times will be more difficult. So we need the Lord. Um, Lorraine. Yes, I see Lorraine's question, and that's good. I'm going to ask that one second. But just to follow up, uh, President Iring used the term live so that you can walk away easily. Now, he was talking about counsel he received at his temple sealing mm -hmm. from the temple sealer. Do you think that that pertained to us? Absolutely. Okay. We've got to cut the, you know, the heartstrings to our material possessions. What happened to Lot's lot wife? Yeah. They, you know, she just couldn't leave it. It was hard. It was hard. You know, um, but what is coming? I mean, when you start studying the new Jerusalem and what that is, nothing we have holds a candle to it. So forget about it. You know, be ready to walk away. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, interesting. Okay, so Lorraine Moore, she says... Can you guys hear me okay? Lorraine Moore says, I just read that the two prophets, according to your study, will probably come from the lost ten tribes. How did you come to understand that? I always thought they would be one of our apostles. Um, well, let's just get it straight that the scriptures do not say, you know, uh, who they are. Um, but the reason that... Um, I believe that they will be coming from um, the lost tribes of Israel. And they, they I mean, they, they could be, you know, from, you know, other places. This is my personal opinion. Um, you know, but the timing is right with the timing of the restoration of the house of Israel. Mm -hmm. Uh, because these three, or these, I mean, there, there's actually three men that come. There's a Davidic servant, um, and then there's these two prophets. And the Davidic ser servant, we know his name is David. Um, but we do not know the other two. And um, the scriptures that talk about the servant whose name is David say that he is raised up in his own place. And usually when you have descriptions like this, it's to be an identifier. You know, when we learned that Christ would be, you know, from okay. Nazareth, it's an identifier so that when you see him, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so how can a David who is raised in his own place be an identifier unless his own place is truly unique from all of our places. Um, and I believe that you have, you know, that um, the allegory of the olive tree refers to this in Jacob chapter five, where you have all these branches broken off and they're broken off. They're scattered and gathered in the order that Israel was scattered and gathered. So the first grafts were from the lost tribes of Israel. And they were transplanted into the poorest place of the vineyard. And there were, it says the first, and the, there's two. The, the lost tribes of Israel were comprised of two grafts. And the first was planted in the worst place of the vineyard. And then the second was planted in a place that was worse than the worst place of the vineyard. So how can you have the yeah. worst place of the vineyard and someone, some place worse than that? It's because it's not in the vineyard. And Isaiah has a uh, revelation that's about the vineyard and people coming from outside of the vineyard. Um, and the Doctrine and Covenants has a similar revelation. So that's why I believe that. And I believe that these two, Isaiah uh, has a revelation of these two yeah. prophets in the last days. And he's specifically talking about the Jews and he says that the Jews will be bereft of their leaders. 
and they have no one to lead them. And then these two come, um, and they come from somewhere else. So could they be coming from America, you know, from the Quorum of the Twelve? Absolutely. That's, you know, I just think it's going to be more than right. that. I think I know what you're alluding to, and there's a lot of discussion about that on the page, but uh, I don't know if you want to go there or not, but... Um, what does, yeah, I mean, I guess we can't talk to her and ask her if that answered the question. But, oh, um, um, that was, <clears throat> yeah, I, yeah, I'd rather just focus on the questions that they have. Okay. Um, I'm, would anyone else like to ask questions? They're having a lot of discussion with each other. Tracy Doby says, will the Antichrist be one of our presidents? I don't know if I'm going to Yeah, I think so. Um. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, well, you know, I'll answer that. Okay. Uh, so, Read what? Yeah, then. So tell, tell me her name. Tracy Durfee. So Tracy Durfee asked a question, will the Antichrist be one of our presidents? So, you know, I, Tracy, you're, you're asking this because of, you know, Ezra Ziegel. And, you know, in Ezra Ziegel, you know, the Antichrist is one of the short feathers. So um, will the Antichrist be somebody like President Trump or President Biden? No, he will not. But will the Antichrist rule over America? Yes, he will. Um, and the scriptures say that he will rule over the entire globe. So um, Daniel talks about the Antichrist and says that the people will not give him the honor of the kingdom, but that he obtains the kingdom through flatteries. So we will see how that happens he is certainly not going to be a president of the United States after the traditional sense, um, but he will control the United States. He will overcome the saints. He will control everything for a while. Um, but the Lord has also provided a way for our deliverance from uh, him as well. Could the Antichrist be a military leader? Question is, could the Antichrist be a military leader? Um, you know, the Antichrist, if the Antichrist is not a military leader, he certainly knows what he is doing, um, because he, you know, goes through very successful military campaigns, um, and decimates, you know, countries that oppose him and people that oppose him. Um, I think that we do not know the Antichrist's identity right now. He's not somebody that you're hearing in the news um, or reading about in the newspapers. Um, why do I say this? Simply because of what the Antichrist can do. Um, I mean, the, the Antichrist, the, the prophecies we have of him are astounding. You know, he, he is, there have been very few people that have pulled off being able to pretend to be deity, that have convinced very many people. You have the David Koresh's of the world that have convinced a small handful to drink his Kool-Aid, but this man, one of the things that is a hallmark about him are his marvelous blasphemies against the Most High and how he changes time and laws. And he can do miracles in the eyes of all the people. He causes fire to come down from heaven. Uh, he does things that are incredible. And, uh, you know, Daniel says that he forecasts his devices against the nations. And no one can stand against him. So he's different. Is he from another world? He's different than um, any person on the national stage or the global stage that I know of. Now, where he's going to be from, I don't know. Um, but do you know of any political figure or military figure that fits this bill? Um, I don't. No. <clears throat> no, I mean, most likely from another world, maybe. Does the, do the scriptures say? <clears throat> um, well, you know, Isaiah talks about this guy, and he talks about him as you know well it's it's really the lord not isaiah the lord is telling um isaiah listen 
I am telling you all of these things before they ever happened. Before you had the strange gods among you. And um, it's interesting when you read in some of the writings that have been recovered from you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's one writing in particular. It's, it's called uh, the War Scroll. And it's about the battle of the sons of light against the sons of darkness. And they're led by a god mm. with a little g. And um, they call him um, Belial. And he's opposed by the Jews and it names off a bunch of groups. And then it says, and they who will be returning from the wilderness. Now, John, when he was talking about the house of Israel, he saw that the main body of the house of Israel would be given wings of an eagle to flee from before the face of the dragon, who is earthbound, and she would flee into the wilderness, but that she would return. So um, this revelation is clearly talking about this remnant is going to return. Um and, and do you think that they're on this earth or somewhere else? Do I think who is? This remnant that you're talking about. Um, I, I think that this remnant that we're talking about is the lost tribes of Israel. Yes. And I think that but, the lost tribes of Israel, there's no doubt that there are members of the lost tribes of Israel that are here on this yeah. earth, scattered amongst all nations. But yeah. there are too many prophecies in the scriptures that I do not understand how anyone can believe that there is not a massive host somewhere that will be returning in Doctrine and Covenants. Just read Doctrine and Covenants section 133, starting in verse 26. They return with their prophets at their head. They have prophets that are different from ours. Okay. And the first thing they come and do is destroy Israel's enemies. They liberate America. And then they come and fall at the feet of the children of Ephraim to be crowned with glory. The children of Ephraim have something that they do not. And they receive it at their hands and then they, they share with the children of Ephraim the rich treasures that they have. And then Zion is established in America and it is made secure. And people will say, hey, we cannot go up to Zion to war against Zion. This is now in DNC 45. Because their inhabitants are terrible. And we cannot stand. It's because of these guys who have come. Christ talks about the remnant of Jacob that will come amongst the Gentiles. And if the Gentiles do not repent, they will wipe them off the face of the earth. Just like the Jaredites were wiped off. Just like the Nephites were wiped off. The Gentiles, unrepentant Gentiles, will be swept off too. But the righteous among the people will be able to help these people, you know, establish the new Jerusalem. Um, so there is no, I believe, and Isaiah says, um, just looking at Isaiah chapter 13, this is one of the Isaiah chapters. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, all of the Isaiah chapters, I, I should say, all of the individual revelations that I that Nephi included of Isaiah, which comprise multiple chapters, they all talk about a host that is coming to the earth from the heavens. They all talk about it. Okay, so where does the city of Enoch play into that? So the city of Enoch is fascinating <clears throat> um, because it mirrors what will happen in the last days. So... You can't understand the city of Enoch, really, unless you understand the book of Enoch, which is quoted, you know, by Peter, who was the president of the church. Yeah. Um, it's quoted by John, who was in the first presidency and is now the senior living apostle of the original church. Yeah. Um, and it was quoted by Jude. Um, in the New Testament. So you have three different sources quoting the book of Enoch. You have the Doctrine and Covenants that says the book of Enoch will be testified of in due time. At the time that 
Um, that was said, we already had the Pearl of Great Price account. So the Lord was not talking about that. And, you know, years later, the Book of Enoch was found and translated into the first reliable English copy. Um, and what the Book of Enoch talks about is fascinating and mirrors what I believe will happen. Um, in the Book of Enoch, it, and you know, you read about this. This is a, an example of the whore of Babylon taking stuff out of the scriptures that they didn't want discussed. And Jude even referenced that, says, hey, we used to know about this, but it's gone. Yeah. We've forgotten this. Um, but I, you know, it talks about incredible things. And if you read uh, Genesis chapter 6, you get a, a hint of this. But the whole book of Enoch is all about that. So, you know, let me get back to the city of Enoch because the book of Enoch is a whole different story. I think you need story. a book. Uh, you need to write a book about the book of Enoch. But anyway. um, you, you know, the, the last section of A Remnant Shall Return talks about that. And the book of Revelation that I wrote yes. talks about that extensively. And I would much rather people read about it in depth than for me to give you a five-minute blurb that is going to make you think that I am... I've lost my mind okay, okay. because the book of Revelation, you cannot talk about the book of Re Revelation in depth without sounding crazy. You can't. You can't talk about what Isaiah really means without sounding crazy. That is why nobody talks about it. Yeah. But it's I talk about it and you will need to let the spirit tell you if I am crazy or whether these things are true. But going back to the city of Enoch. So the city of Enoch was on the earth in a time that will be exactly similar to what we will experience in the last days. The earth was filled with violence, for, uh, for instance. Immorality was rampant. Um, and the Lord tells Enoch, go and preach the gospel. So he does it. And everyone that believes gathers in to his city. There is a gathering. And it's the only righteous place. The rest of the, the world is, you know, there's bloodshed continually and wars and violence. And then in time, the Lord takes the city of Enoch away. And the scriptures that we have that talk about this are found in Moses chapter 7. And... We read these things too quickly and at too surface level. Go back and read, you know, everyone, anyone who is listening to this, go back and read Moses 7 and find the part where I'm talking about right now. So Enoch has already been lifted up. He is somewhere else with the Lord looking down at the earth. And they're watching the wickedness that's taking place here. And the Lord begins to weep. And Enoch is astounded. Because Enoch has seen who the Lord really is. He has seen the universe. What it is comprised of. And he is shocked that the father of it all is weeping because of this insignificant speck of dust. And he says that. He says, Lord, if you were to take this earth and break it down to its particles. This is smaller than grains of sand. And a million Earths like it. It's, it's crazy that Enoch would even say millions of Earths like this. Because this was on nobody's radar. Um, but it was on Enoch's because he had been up and seen it. He knows that there's millions of Earths like this. And if you were to break all of them into their particles you know, smaller than grains of sand, of millions of earths, it would not be the beginning of the Lord's creations, of populated, inhabited worlds. He is much greater than we understand. Yeah. And then he goes on to say, and thou hast taken Enoch up to the, the city of Enoch, up to thy own bosom, from all thy creations, from all eternity to all eternity. So right there he says, 
the city of Enoch is not just my people. It's the righteous from all thy creations. That doesn't mean that um, the city of Enoch is immense. It means that the righteous from all creations come to it. It's like, I mean, right now you could say that it's the capital of the universe. You know, and um, it's awesome. So read about it in there. But it says that the New Jerusalem in that same chapter will be established here upon the American continent. And that the, it shall, uh, that the righteous from all the creations that the Father has made will flow into it. So again, you have those two similarities. And those will be much more meaningful, are much more meaningful when you understand the context of the events of the latter days, which is impossible to understand without the Holy Ghost. Most people have no idea about what is about to happen. Wow, <laughs> I'm getting chills. Um, Andrew Joy has a good question, but I want to touch on something that you said first, and then mm -hmm. Andrew, we're going to I'm going to ask this about the biblical holidays. That's interesting. Um, Elder Uchtdorf in the last conference said that God is among us. Um, he said it over and over. It's the mm -hmm. title of the talk. God is among us. And then he also said, "How? what would you do if he came to your house or sat with you in church? And then he says, he will. He would see you as you are. <clears throat> what do you think was meant by all of that? Well, uh, Christ... You meant, I'm sorry, the reason <clears throat> I, I asked the question is because you said Enoch saw God for who he is. <clears throat> what do you think it means he will see you as you are and that he's among us? Well, you know, I think that to understand what he's talking about, you, you need to understand what Christ told um, the Jews when they questioned him for, you know, they could not understand Christ because Jesus Christ was a mystery. Like I said, it's the Old Testament's greatest mystery. And so they're saying, just tell us, is the kingdom of God coming you know and christ told them the kingdom of god is within you and you know there have been numerous prophets and i talk about their quotes in the appendix of when i you know talk about the light of christ in that book which is very interesting because they talk about a secret and sacred door to the presence of the Father and how you open that. And, you know, they said that you do that through meditation. And really, I mean, there's, you have these Eastern religions that, you know, they use meditation to try to achieve, attain enlightenment, which if you look at what they define enlightenment is, is to have this kind of experience where they realize that they are part of something much greater. Um, and they realize that they can tap into it. And that is, this enlightenment is, you tap in to what I believe is the light of Christ that is everywhere. And you can realize, holy smokes, I'm nothing. And there is all of this. And, you know, I think that God is among us because the light of Christ is everywhere. There is no place where it's not. So all things are before the Lord's face. He knows everything that is going on everywhere. So absolutely, there is nothing that we can hide from the Lord. Um, and you can have a very personal relationship with the Lord because of this. Um, the Lord doesn't operate in the same way that we do. Um, we tend to think of things based off of our five senses. But resurrected beings are not limited to those five senses. There are different attributes that are we cannot understand because we don't have that paradigm. 
But so. yeah, but the Lord operates with much greater capacities than we do. So he can do things that we cannot even fathom. And it's not difficult or complex. It's as, it's as natural and easy as what we're doing now. Um, because of his incredible capacities. So that's, I mean, that's the tip of that iceberg. Yeah. Um, well, Satan tries to tell us that we can hide, right? Mm -hmm. Cover ourselves. Oh, and, yeah, absolutely. That, that's yeah. the whole, that's the whole thing. Hey, you guys are naked. Go cover up your nakedness. Yes. And so Satan provides this covering and then the Lord provides a different covering. Satan's covering, you know, I have a fig tree right here. You can't see it. Yeah. But fig tree, I mean, Fine. fig leaves, yeah, they, they shed their leaves. You could just pick them up. There's a lot of coverage on those leaves. Yeah. You know, but it costs you nothing. Uh, that was Satan's covering, which was worthless. It didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. um, the Lord knew immediately that they were naked. Um, <laughs> Conversely, the Lord asks his son to provide them a covering. That covering required something to die. You know, it was a covering of skins. So, uh, you know, symbolically, an, a lamb was sacrificed to cover their nakedness. Um, so that is the meaning behind that, you know. Christ can cover us. That is what the Hebrew word for atonement is. It's kafar, it's to cover. So he can cover us. Satan certainly cannot. I just want to repeat that, make sure everybody caught that. Um, I hadn't heard of that brought up before. In the case of the atonement, something had to die because we're covered in skins, symbolically, um, and in the Ezekiel, they actually used skins for the priesthood. Very interesting. I like that. It's a great, great metaphor. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's another mystery, mystery of the Old Testament that's not really a mystery. Yeah, well, it was to me until you just said it. So thank you for that. Um, My had a question too. Oh, okay, go Good ahead. Good Matt Crowley. Oh, let's oh. answer that one. Kind of goes back to the stout horn. Okay. How, okay. how is Ezra's eagle helpful? discerning the stout horn, but you may want to repeat the question. Okay. How is Ezra's eagle, Mike Crowley asks, how is Ezra's eagle important? I don't see the helpful. question. Helpful. Oh, helpful? In discerning the stout horn. In discerning the stout horn. <clears throat> okay, well, um, I think that Ezra's eagle is important in discerning who the stout horn is because of the timing. You know, that's the, that's the greatest thing, one of the greatest things about Ezra's eagle is it gives you a number and an order and you can follow it. And hey, once you see this happen, then you're seeing the three heads of the great eagle. And then you see those three and then you know this guy is the, the stout horn. He's the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, that timing of that vision is very important. It's, it's a shame that so few people know about this. I mean, the Apocrypha used to be in everyone's Bible. Um, it's still in many people's Bibles. I mean, the, it's still part of you know, Catholic Bibles, but we use the King James Bible. And the uh, Church of England decided to remove the Apocrypha from the Bible right before the turn of the 19th century, or the 20th century, sorry. Um, so and the pilgrims came across, uh, they had the, this vision of Ezra's eagle in their Bible. When, you know, Ab or, uh, George Washington put his, well, every, you know, Abraham Lincoln yeah. too. When, when they put their hands on those Bibles, it included yeah. Ezra's eagle. The, apo the apocrypha was in there. All the saints that crossed the plains, yeah. they had this in their Bibles. Um, so it's, it's only, you know, at the dawn of the modern age that we've lost this. Why do you think that the current, our prophets have not reinstated it as a part of our daily works? Well, um, Joseph Smith asked that question, right? <clears throat> he said, hey, should I translate the Apocrypha, Lord? Lord said, you don't need to. He said, it's mostly correct. There are errors in it. But if you will read it with the Spirit, you will profit by it. 
So, and we're also commanded numerous times to seek information from good books. Mm -hmm. So the Apocrypha is a book that is purported scripture. And you have the Lord saying, it's mostly right. Um, and if you read it with the Spirit, you will benefit by it. And just like his son tells us, hey, study the words of Isaiah. We don't. So is it up to our prophets to bang us on the head and tell us everything that we need to be doing? Or should we be anxiously engaged in our own spiritual education? The answer is, it's our responsibility to educate ourselves. Yeah, good. Thank you. Um, will the priesthood, this is from Jennifer Brickerstaff. Is this the one you were looking at, Amy? Um, Andrew Jacob Joy, you did say you would ask. Oh, I'm sorry, question. Andrew. That's, that's right. He was asking about the Jewish holidays. Um, and their significance in the I last can days. It you can't find it. Um, Do you see it? Sorry, guys, I'm trying to. Oh, here it is. No, that's not it. <laughs> Just say it to me. Yeah, Just say ahead. it loud, babe. Having not read any of your works, what significance do you think the biblical holidays have in terms of teaching about the last days? <clears throat> well, I think that the biblical holidays are very important and were given to teach the house of Israel things. Um, and I think, you know, the most famous biblical holiday is the Passover, right? <clears throat> um, which goes back to the most miraculous deliverance that ever occurred outside of the, you know, atonement of Jesus Christ, which, you know, is miraculous, far more miraculous than dividing a Red Sea. But as far as the miracles of the scriptures, the um, atonement or the uh, Passover celebration celebrates that and is to remind us of those events so that we remember the history of Israel because the history of Israel will repeat. We are going to be utterly dependent upon the Lord to deliver us. We are going to need those kinds of things to happen. You know, uh, President Nelson said the most impressive and, you know, Im important miracles that have ever occurred will occur in our days. So more impressive than manna from heaven. <clears throat> yes, more impressive than the exodus of Egypt and all of that. Now, even more than that, I mean, you look at um, the Passover celebration, the feast. I mean, they would have the bitter herb, which is incredibly strong horseradish mm -hmm. that you eat and it makes you, you know, <laughs> weep. And, you know, it's to remind you of the bitterness of slavery. The, in, the, in the Passover, there is this script that you follow. And I find it miraculous yeah that the Heavenly Father is always referred to in that script as the God of the universe, mm -hmm. okay? That is going to have profound meaning to us in the coming days. Um, the Jews would leave a chair for Elijah mm -hmm. because they knew Elijah was supposed to come again. Uh -huh. And he came again on Passover to Joseph Smith and restored keys. So absolutely, the, these things, there is meaning and symbolism. The Lord you know, didn't just want to create a bunch of parties. He was trying to teach the Jews. Um, all of these things were to be a schoolmaster. So yeah, there is. So it's almost likening it to how the law of Moses then gets carried out in the New Testament, we lose the law of Moses, but there's the pattern repeats. Yeah. So you're saying that the holidays are a pattern, and we can look to that. <clears throat> they were they were meant to teach us, and there's there's some symbolism in the Book of Revelation that you will not understand unless you understand about some of the the Jewish holidays. 
So would you recommend a, a study of the book of Esther for those who haven't really... Um, you, you know, I, I think that, you know, rather than giving people a list of books that I recommend that they, they study, I think that it's important, you know, to listen to what's the Lord telling you. If you don't know what the Lord's telling you, ask him, you know, and he'll tell you what to do. Um, and then go go and do it and listen for what the next thing he does. He asks you. That's the whole concept of, of what lack I yet? What what does my spiritual education lack? How can I fill that void? I don't want to tell you to go and read the book of Esther or go and read the book of Second Ezra. You know, I want you to go and ask the Lord what you should read. Um, and he'll do it. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Um, I'm not able to keep up with questions because I'm what? so wrapped. We've been going two hours? Yeah, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, let's 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 do two more questions and then okay. we'll wrap it up. There's two more that I can see. Okay, you want to read it to me loud? Unless you have one, Jennifer. Oh, no, go ahead, Amy. I'm just still scrolling. Okay. Uh, let's say it loud. Tammy Lindley asked, do you think the government and media are trying to prepare us for some kind of deceitful counterfeit with an increase of talk about UFOs? <clears throat> you know, that is a, a great question. Um, it's, it's a fascinating question. Um, so Marco Rubio, who sits um, on a specific committee where he gets briefed um, by uh, members from the Pentagon about things that are happening worldwide is constantly hearing about these UFOs that are infiltrating our most secure airspace. And there's nothing that we can do about them. And so as part of the stimulus bill, uh, the COVID stimulus relief bill that President Trump signed right before leaving office, he included this requirement that all government agencies had to release everything that they knew about UFOs. And they have to do it by June. <clears throat> so now you are, I mean, people are preparing these reports. I mean, it's the law. And so you're starting to see things come out of the Pentagon. I mean, just recently, yeah. There, there was this aircraft, you know, I don't know if it was an aircraft carrier or some military vessel, I'm not sure what kind it was, but they're filming these, their pyramids in the sky, doing maneuvers all around their ship, and they're filming it in their, you know, high-tech cameras, and they're, these, I mean, pyramids can't, can't fly, but they're flying. And they're doing maneuvers that we can't do in our most advanced aircraft. And then you have other military personnel and their, um, their you know, the USS uh, Nimbits filmed a fleet of what they called 40-foot Tic Tacs, white Tic Tacs, that could go from sea level to 80,000 feet instantaneously. And they were zipping all around their craft. Their sh I mean, they're bigger than their jets that they're flying around in. And they can outmaneuver them. And they have hours of footage of these things. And they can fly into the ocean at, at high speed. And come out of the ocean at high speed. I mean, they have all of this stuff on film. Yeah, it just happened in Hawaii, too. <laughs> yeah, and so, you know, the question is, are they faking this or is it real? And the people that are seeing these things are convinced that it's real. I mean, just to give you an idea, I mean, one of these guys from the, the Pentagon, he, he was on Glenn Beck, and he was talking about some of the things that these things could do, and whether we should consider them to be a national threat or not. And he told Glenn Beck, he said, well, think about it this way. Your home is your, your place. You want to feel safe in it. 
So you invest in the most secure system, security system that money can buy. Yet every morning you wake up and there's muddy boot prints going across from one door to the next, showing somebody, regardless of your technology, is in your house and you can't do anything about it. Then he, he told Glenn Beck, this happens to us every single day. <clears throat> um, so is that guy lying? <laughs> I mean, uh, I have read this book. It's called The Day After Roswell. And it's about the guy who headed up the Army's R&D program. And he said, I began getting artifacts the day after Roswell that I was told were from foreign universities. And they clearly were way more advanced than that. I mean, we had no idea how these things were technologically possible. I mean, making, making metals with more neutrons than should be possible. But they're there. And the characteristics of the metal is beyond belief has strength and flexibility that we cannot account for, nor can we replicate. So is he lying? No. No, he is not lying. And you know, go and read the book of Enoch. That is not a lie. Um, it was written thousands of years ago, and it talks about, he calls them watchers, that descended from heaven. And they came here, and they knew that they shouldn't be doing this. But they saw how beautiful the women were here, and they, they and there were 200 of them. And they said, hey, the, the, the leader of them said, I know we shouldn't do this, but I want to, and I don't want you guys going and telling anybody about this. So I'm not doing it unless we all promise we're all in this together. And so they all say, okay, we're all doing it. And then they began introducing incredible technologies to the, you know, uh, they arrived in the days when Enoch's father was a kid. And then they, they corrupted the, the earth. And it talks about them in Genesis 6. But, I mean, they're here for 2,000 years. And we have no, I mean, that part in our scriptures is gone. Somebody took it out. 2,000 years is covered in Genesis chapter 6. So um, there is more to this. I don't think, do, do I think that people are going to manipulate this and try to take advantage of it? Sure, absolutely. Do I think that the whore of Babylon has infiltrated, you know, the governments of the earth and the medias of the earth? Absolutely. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So two things. If you look at Mayan civilizations, it talks about what you're talking about. That's probably 2,000 pages might talk about what's going on there because their technology was unbelievable for as I mean, as that there's so much of the ancient world. In fact, yeah. the Sumerian culture is an archaeological anomaly. Uh, it's, it came into being thousands of years before it should have. And... I mean, they had aqueducts and advanced city layouts and mathematics that were incredible, written languages immediately. And they can't trace that language back to any other language. And they're saying, where, how did this happen? You know, it doesn't follow the pattern. Um, so, I mean, it's a, there's lots of interesting things. And this is a big rabbit hole that would take more than, you know, two hours to discuss. Yeah. But. Well, a question that came up on the page, I haven't seen it in this actual chat, but it was on the page earlier, uh, Starlink. Do you want to talk about that at all? Uh, the Starlink satellites? Yeah. Is it related to what you were saying before? Um, well, let me say I have had no briefings from <laughs> Elon Musk about his Starlink system, but I have seen them. Um and, you know, it, I have no idea. 
Okay. Yeah, <laughs> <question>. No theories. <laughs> yeah. No hypothesis. Yeah. Any other theories? Yeah. No, okay. Uh, is, is there one last question that you've got ready? There is one. Two, three people liked the question, so maybe we should ask. Okay. One. This will be our last question. Carolyn Ralph. How does the mark of the beast tie into where we can't shop, buy, sell, etc.? Is the mark of the beast a system of the Antichrist? Yeah, right in the book of Revelation, it says that it is. Um, but, you know, that the mark of the beast has, has never made more sense than it does today. If you want to understand the mark of the beast, just study China's social credit system. And then you'll understand how it's possible to be able to cut somebody off from participating in the economy. Um, I mean, China, the Chinese uh, credit system, I mean, you have to have a credit score. You know, we have a credit score that allows us to borrow, you know, money, right? At certain, you know, rates. China has taken this to the next level where if your social credit score is below a certain level, you cannot have health care. You cannot get a, a, a butt on a bus. You can't use public transportation of any kind. You can't fly anywhere. I mean, it's, uh, furthermore, everybody, you, you have to have this app on your phone and everybody is alerted when you are by them if your um, credit score, social credit score is too low and they are to shame you. So it's meant to get you to conform to a way of life. And this has only been possible for China to do this because of American Silicon Valley technology that has been introduced there. So that the groundwork for that kind of technology exists already. So, yeah. So you're saying yes, yes. Uh, um, yeah, I, I'm saying it's, it's it's possible the Antichrist is going to do something like that. Uh, John says he's going to do that. Uh, I do not think it's going to be six 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 written on your forehead. Yeah. It's going to be you know something far more. You know, keep in mind that if it were something so blatant like that, everyone would say, "Hey, I think I've heard something." About <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to do it. But uh, you know, um, Michael, where is John? Do you think? Um, actually, next door. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, John. So old John. There. Yeah, I, I have no idea. I, no. I have gotten no Christmas cards from him. But, uh, you know, Joseph Smith said that John was with the Lost Tribes of Israel, preparing them for their return. Okay. So Mormon said that the three Nephites were also, or would also, administer amongst the Lost Tribes of Israel. So, I mean, when you study... The book of, you know, Revelation in particular, um, you're going to see that the Lord gave John a very important mission. And the restoration of the house of Israel is paramount amongst it. So John, I believe, is, is with them. But, I mean, he can, he can do things that we can't. He's had changes. Happened to him that, that we can't. I mean, yeah. I mean, you have you have you have examples in the scriptures. I mean, Christ, an angry mob is around him, trying to push him off a cliff, and then he's gone. You have Philip baptizing the the Ethiopian eunuch, and then he's gone. He's taken to another city that's more than a day's journey away. Nephi is taken to an exceedingly high mountain where he's never stepped foot upon. He. He didn't seem to be talking of it in a visionary sense. He thought he was there. Um, and you have another Nephi who preached the gospel being carried through the spirit from place to place. So, yeah, these people can move in ways that we can't. Uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's possible that uh, John could be wherever he wanted at any given time. That's why I say I have no idea where he is. But generally yeah. speaking, he's he's ministering amongst the lost tribes of Israel. Okay, very good.
All right. Well, thanks for having inviting me to do this again, and uh, thank we'll you. have to do it again. Thank sometime. you so much for your time. All right.